friends, it's Emma here, the Bookish Princess. I'm sitting down today to start my Feb Regency reading vlog. I thought it would be fun to do a vlog for the month to share the Regency era reads that I'm gonna be working through and some fun winter scenes and updates from around the farmhouse. Last year during Feb Regency, Feb Regency is of course our readathon running throughout the month of February dedicated to Britain's Regency era. Um, this is its third year and last year I managed to do weekly reading vlogs which were super fun. I'll try to remember to leave them linked in the description below if you want to check them out. Um, but I'm kind of impressed looking back that I managed to do that because I was also um, getting out uh, the second book in my kitten storybook series, The Book of Cymbeline, which is here, should I go get it? The Book of Simply the Second, A Kitten's Tale from Fall to Winter came out last February. But looking back, I'm surprised that I managed to do the reading vlogs and get the book out. My third book in the series came out at the end of November, The Book of Simply the Third, A Kitten's Tale from Winter to Spring. I love describing the seasonal shifts in these books um, alongside the uh, cat anecdotes, and especially Winter to Spring is so magical. Right now, we're in exactly this season. Like, it's still very snowy outside, but the first signs of spring are just starting to up here. I planted some crocuses in the fall. Those were just starting to come up and then we got a bunch of snow, which actually I'm really glad of because now the deer can't eat them. Hopefully this blanket of snow is keeping all of my nice spring bulbs nice and cozy and warm. And then once it melts, um, hopefully they'll spring up um, and be blooming before you know it. When it comes to Feb Regency though, I definitely did better with the videos <laughs> last year, but you know, that's okay. Every year is different. Every season is different. A big part of it I think is Lent. Lent is the liturgical season leading up to Easter in the Christian church where commemorating the 40 days Christ spent in the desert. So it's a time for fasting and repentance and reflection um, leading up to Good Friday, which was Christ's passion, and then his rising from the dead on Easter Sunday. Over the past couple years in particular, I've tried to spend less time on social media and on the internet, particularly during Lent. And I think during our first Feb Regency, Lent didn't start till early March, so that was fine. And then last year, Lent started late February, so it didn't really overlap much. But this year, Lent started on Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday were the same day. So that is a big part of the reason uh, why I have not been around as much this Feb Regency. However, I have been trying to keep up here and there um, with all the fun Feb Regency things you guys have been posting. It's been so fun to hear what people are reading down in the comments or in your own videos. So many other booktubers have been doing the Feb Regency tag. That was Christy's idea to do a tag to go along with the readathon. The Feb Regency tag is new this year, but we do have another group read and that is Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth. I have been making very good progress in this. I really just had the last chunk, the last volume um, to go. I read Belinda before, but it had been a while and it has been so much fun to revisit it. So Belinda is our heroine and she is basically being launched into London society. We really are thrown in at the deep end right alongside Belinda. She has grown up kind of in retirement. Her parents passed away. Um, she's been raised partially under the care of her aunt Stanhope. And her aunt is known in society for having a bunch of impecunious nieces who need to be married off. And they've all been married off well, but Belinda didn't actually grow up with the aunt the way some of the other nieces, some of her sisters and cousins did. She grew up in the countryside and she has this simplicity and straightforwardness to her. She's a little bit of a blank slate, but she does have these good instincts that end up being very important. So Belinda goes to stay with the fascinating Lady Delacour. She is basically the queen bee of London high society. She throws the best parties. She's extremely witty. Everyone wants to be invited to her house. Everyone wants to, you know, go to her soirees and her salon, but since Belinda gets to go stay with her, she sees behind the scenes. And because she does have this simplicity and straightforwardness, her eyes are open and she notices that what the world sees is different from what goes on behind the scenes. There's a lot of unhappiness. There's this undercurrent of anxiety. There's a lot of animosity. Unfortunately, Lady Delacour and her husband are really at loggerheads. So Belinda starts to realize that what society values and what actually brings happiness and meaning in life are not really one and the same. Even Lady Delacour, who is really 
in the thick of this, you know, endless round of sort of thoughtless gaiety, she's impressed by Belinda's simplicity and ends up confiding to Belinda her story, which we get fairly early on. The first chunk of the book really is like Regency high society soap opera, like so dramatic. There's a duel. There's a duel between women, um, which is very interesting. So many of the issues discussed here like are still so relevant, even though it's not called feminism, obviously. There's a very interesting commentary on feminism. Really beautiful discussion of like the feminine virtues of prudence and delicacy, and yet an acknowledgement that prudence and delicacy can sometimes be taken too far. There are just so many great elements because the characters are so interesting and the dialogue is so witty. Lady Delicacy or especially always has something funny to say during the beginning especially when we're just you know in the thick of it with Lady Delacour and in this like endless round of just soap opera drama and high society sort of shallowness it's been long enough since I read this that I was wondering to myself like surely there's more to this book than than just this right like I don't think I would have liked it so much if it was just this and there is more to the book than that we do change scenes we meet the Percivals I love the Percivals Helena is such a delightful character I've been underlining so many different passages here's one why will you delight in making yourself appear worse than you are my dear Lady Delacour said Belinda taking her hand because I hate to be like other people said her ladyship who delight in making themselves appear better than what they are Lady Delacour is such a fascinating character. There's not really a character like her in Jane Austen because it's as if you took, say, a Mary Crawford or even a Lady Susan, but like gave her some good instincts underneath that that were pulling her through and pulling her back towards virtue. So it's really satisfying to see Lady Delacour like trying to do better, even though she's constantly led astray by her pride. It really is amazing that Belinda is able to turn out as well as she does. I, I like Belinda a lot, but in some ways I feel like she is she always remains a little bit of a blank slate. She doesn't have as much character as Jane Austen heroines, because Jane Austen heroines, their flaws and their foibles make them so unique. Like Elizabeth, she runs her mouth too much sometimes, and Fanny, on the contrary, is too retiring and reticent sometimes, and Emma has too high an opinion of herself. But yeah, Belinda doesn't have that sort of lovable fault, and yet I like her a lot, and I like a lot of the descriptions. This is when Belinda is kind of finding her feet. Lady Delacour was not a person on whose counsels Belinda could rely. Our heroine was not one of those daring spirits who were ambitious of acting for themselves. She felt the utmost diffidence of her own powers, yet at the same time a firm resolution not to be led even by timidity into follies, which the example of Lady Delacour had taught her to despise. Belinda's prudence seemed to increase with the, nece with the necessity for its exertion. Very much looking forward to finishing Belinda. I think I know how it ends, especially with Belinda's love interest, but at the same time I don't remember all the details. You know how when you watch a murder mystery sometimes, like when I watch an episode of Poirot, and I know I've watched it before, or maybe I've read that Agatha Christie before, but I can't quite remember who the murderer was and how it was done. It's, it's like that. I can't quite remember how everything wraps up. So I'm very excited to refresh my memory and finish this up. The other Feb Regency read that I have been making good progress in is Child Harold's Pilgrimage. This is also for the We Love Jenny readathon in memory of Jennifer Brooks, a booktuber who passed away um, at the beginning of this year. Jennifer was one of the Feb Regency co-hosts um, and during a poetry salon we did, she talked about this so beautifully. She loved Byron and she loved uh, the travels in this too because she, she loved Italy. So I've been really enjoying reading this in her memory. I'm just a couple cantos in. The first canto takes us through Spain. I believe we're about to head to Greece. Italy, I think, comes towards the end. This edition I found on eBay. Like it has an old book plate in it, which is so cute. I love used books that have fun markings um, in it. There's someone who marked with a light pink pen, which I really love, and one person who marked it with a pencil. So it's very fun to see their favorite passages. This edition was published by Crowell. I can't find a year, but I do have another Crowell book. This one um, is 1895, so I'm guessing this one is similar, maybe early 1900s, but they're so beautiful. I love these two, and it feels like they go together. I bought this one last Feb Regency. Feb Regency is never good for my <laughs> book buying habits. Although, you know what? I only bought this one Child Herald's Pilgrimage this year, so that's not too bad. Um, but this version is actually edited edited by Thomas Moore, who is an Irish poet and a very good friend of Lord Byron. And the, the, this other book that I have 
is, is Thomas More's poems. Um, so it feels very appropriate to have these two um, side by side on my shelf. If anyone can tell me how to get rid of Sharpie on a book, I don't know if you can see that. I tried um, using a little nail polish remover and I feel like it didn't work, but I wish they hadn't done that. Why? What library wrote on the spine of this gorgeous book? That's okay. You know what? I was probably able to afford it because it had that marking on it. Anyway, I really enjoyed Thomas More's footnotes because he will quote from Lord Byron's letters and diaries. And this poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, is very much based on Byron's own travels. In fact, it's kind of ironic that he even bothers to sort of disguise himself as Child Harold, this like fictional not really fictional, um, protagonist. Moore does also often fill you in on like the, the people being referenced or the historical events being referenced. I love this passage. Or vales that teem with fruits, romantic hills. Oh, that such hills upheld a freeborn race. Whereon to gaze the eye with joyance fills. Child Harold wends through many a pleasant place. Though sluggards deem it but a foolish chase and marvel men should quit their easy chair, the toilsome way and long, long league to trace. Oh, there is sweetness in the mountain air and life that bloated ease can never hope to share. I do love Child Harold's wanderlust. So deemed the child as o'er the mountains he did take his way in solitary guise. Sweet was the scene, yet soon he thought to flee, more restless than the swallow in the skies. Though here a while he learned to moralize, for meditation fixed at times on him, and conscious reason whispered to despise his early youth, misspent in maddest whim. But as he gazed on truth, his aching eyes grew dim. To horse, to horse, he quits, forever quits a scene of peace, though soothing to his soul. Again he rouses from his moping fits, but seeks not now the harlot and the bowl. Onward he flies, nor fixed as yet the goal, where he shall rest him on his pilgrimage. And o'er him many changing scenes must roll, ere toil his thirst for travel can assage, or he shall calm his breast, or learn experience sage. So this has been a great Regency read so far. I'm very excited to make more progress in it. I do have a couple things I haven't started yet. Christie's Web Regency Challenge was to read a work of historical fiction, and there were so many great um, uh, Georgette Hare suggestions in the, the comments that I kind of want to read one of those. And then I also want to read The Wild Irish Girl by Lady Morgan. I'm thinking I might start that later in February because then I could carry it over and be reading it for St. Patrick's Day. So maybe I won't plan to finish that one, but to at least start it by later in the month. That would be for Stephanie's challenge, which was read a new to you Regency era author. Although Belinda um, in the very beginning had a little introduction, had a little disclaimer by Mariah Edgeworth herself, I believe. Here's an advertisement. Every author has a right to give what appellation he may think proper to his works. The public have also a right to accept or refuse the classification that is presented. The following work is offered to the public as a moral tale. The author not wishing to acknowledge a novel. Were all novels like those of Madame de Crusaz, Mrs. Inchbald, Miss Burney, or Dr. Moore, she would adopt the name of novel with delight. But so much folly, error, and vice are disseminated in books classed under this denomination that it is hoped the wish to assume another title will be attributed to feelings that are laudable and not fastidious. Which I feel like this is just like in um, Northanger Abbey, Jane Austen, where she's parodying the gothic novel, but at the same time, there's a defense of the novel. Um, and so it's just very fun to come across that in Mariah Edgeworth. But I'm noticing all these authors' names. Mrs. Inchbald um, wrote Lover's Vows, which is the play referenced in um, Jane Austen's Mansfield Park. I read that last year for Feb Regency and loved it. And then Miss Burney, Fanny Burney, of course, she wrote Evelina and Camilla and Cecilia. Madame de Crusaz, which there's a little um, footnote saying author of Caroline de Lichtfield, I have not heard of. And Dr. Moore, I'm wondering if that's Thomas Moore? this Thomas More or a different author. So I feel like those could be great little um, hints of, you know, other for that for Stephanie's challenge as well. There are so many references to poetry and other authors in um, Belinda that I'm constantly wanting to stop and look up. I have been enjoying the story so much that I haven't really read the footnotes, but this um, edition does have a ton. So there's a little Feb Regency update. It has been so snowy outside. It has been very cozy to so stay indoors and spend some time uh, you know, going back in time with a good book. And actually, earlier this month, I did purchase a new, very cozy reading nook, which maybe I'll show you guys. So I've been wanting to buy a little settee or sofa 
um, to go in between my bookshelves for a while, but I couldn't find the right one. I kept kind of checking different places. I did find this on Wayfair. I think it's so, so pretty. It does give me Regency era vibes. I just love all the details. Look at how it has a little flower carved into it. And the color just feels perfect for my space because it kind of tones. This is a Rifle Paper Company um, carpet that I got a couple years ago. And then I have like light blue on the windows. So it just feels like it kind of tones nicely with everything. And it also goes, um, I feel like, with this chair, which yeah, here's my this is a little behind the scenes <laughs> vlog setup, um, which this chair I got years and years ago and I love it, but it's so hard to match. And I didn't want like a sofa that like exactly matched it, but I feel like these two, they look like they're just this, in the same kind of family. And then what used to be there was my desk and I actually moved my desk around to this side of the room, which my computer is hidden behind the quilt. So I've always had the quilt hanging on that wall. My cousin Becky made me this gorgeous um, book quilt. But see, this is in my effort to spend less time on the internet and just be more present in the moment because I don't really like having this black screen staring at me when I'm just sitting reading a book. So it's kind of nice. I can just tuck the computer away when it's not in use and then I'm not thinking about what's happening online. I'm just thinking about having a cozy time in the farmhouse. But yes, the settee has made for such a delightful new reading nook. This is so comfortable. I've just loved this so much. It's like so lovely to sit. Oh, look, I match it today with my um, <laughs> my gray sweater. But yeah, I'm very excited about my new sort of Regency settee. Don't you think Lady Delacour would come and sit and chat and gossip with me here? <laughs> down and give you all one more Feb Regency update as we approach the end of the month. We did have our Belinda book club just this past weekend. It was so much fun to chat with everybody. There were so many insightful observations and it was really great to just go deeper into the story and into the characters. There were so many great quotations. It was really fun to hear everyone's favorite lines. I have been posting some of my favorite quotations over on my Substack, bookishprincess.substack.com. I posted um, a Feb Regency update towards the middle of the month and now I'm hoping um, to get one up at the end of the month as well. But definitely hop over there if you want to hear more. One of the lines we were talking about, though, is this letter from Clarence Hervey. And he says, my friend Dr. X divides mankind into three classes. Those who learn from the experience of others, they are happy men. Those who learn from their own experience, they are wise men. And lastly, those who learn neither from their own nor from other people's experience, they are fools. <laughs> this class is by far the largest. What was interesting about this observation was that 
that we were connecting it with the characters in the book. And Belinda, I mentioned earlier, is like a little bit of a, a blank slate. She doesn't have so very many flaws. And that's partly because she is one of the happy who learns from the experience of others. She learns fairly early on from the experience of Lady Delacour. Whereas Lady Delacour, who's honestly a lot more interesting and fun, but she, we could probably say, learns from her own experience and she is wise. And maybe there are some benefits from learning from your own experience versus that of others, although you're definitely going to take some more knocks yourself <laughs> if you're learning from your own mistakes. One point that Tristan made was that this is a moral novel and Belinda, the character, kind of is the baseline, especially once she learns from Lady Delacour's experience. She's like this steady line and we can kind of track the, the vacillations of other characters based on Belinda. Although we were also talking about how Belinda herself is not perfect. She almost makes a pretty big mistake and even the Percivals, they don't give infallible advice. Lady Anne Percival is, is you know, very wise. Um, although actually maybe she's more happy and Lady Delacour is wise. Um, but Lady Anne does have very good takes most of the time, but I don't want to give any spoilers. You should absolutely read this book for yourself. If you are looking to get into Regency literature apart from Jane Austen, I think Belinda would be the best place to start because it feels the most like Jane Austen. I think the language isn't overly dense and the characters are so charming and the issues discussed are so interesting. I really can't recommend recommend this one highly enough. I'm thinking of the Fanny Burney novels that I've read and even the other books by Mariah Edgeworth and Belinda stands out, I would say, as like kind of your best gateway into the into more Regency era literature. There really are so many Regency era authors and it's funny like on booktube and just out in the world we're not necessarily aware of them because they lived so long ago and I think Victorian authors are more popular and more well read but it is so delightful to to unearth some of these gems and I feel like every year during Feb Regency I learn about some new author or some new thing that I want to follow up on. Dr. X, he is uh, has lots of pithy sayings and apparently he was based on that Dr. Moore from the beginning who is not the poet, um, the Irish poet. He was, I, I believe, I, I think I googled it and his name was Dr. John Moore, but now I totally want to go and try to find um, his novels because that's pretty crazy that she put her favorite writer or novelist, Dr. Moore, she then put him as a, a sort of character in this book. The language in Belinda, I would say, is quite approachable and has a light touch, like Jane Austen, I think, has a light touch, even though she still has this wonderful mastery of language and vocabulary that you see so much in Regency literature. But I did start on Wild Irish Girl by Lady Morgan, and that really got me thinking about the difference between the language in Regency books versus even Victorian books. I think Regency writers just had this command and deftness with words that is, is pretty much unmatched. Reading some of these passages, it's like watching a dance or an elaborate dance or, you know, watching a, a sports game where there's like a lot going on at one time. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to follow. Sometimes it, it's kind of a workout for your brain, but just the way they kind of weave in and out of these different ideas and different vocabulary to get towards their final point. I think that was a hallmark of this time period of, you know, the elite of the elite could use language just so, so well. We see it in Lady Delacour, you know, that's why she's so popular. She's so witty and she, you know, is does such a good job um, with language. And I think probably today's audiences would prefer Belinda and Lady Delacour because it's a little bit lighter, but I'm really enjoying Wild Irish Girl and just the, the intricacy of the passages. Here is the very, very beginning. I just had to laugh at this because I had to like think hard to follow what he was actually trying to say. If there are certain circumstances under which a fond father can address an imprisoned son without suffering the bitterest heart rendings of paternal agony, such are not those under which I now address you. To sustain the loss of the most precious of all human rights and forfeit our liberty at the shrine of virtue in defense of our country abroad or of our public integrity and principles at home brings to the heart of the sufferer's dearest sympathizing friend a soothing solace, almost concomitant to the poignancy of his afflictions. This is vocabulary, all of it, and leaves the decision difficult whether in the scale of human feelings, triumphant pride or affectionate regret preponderate. Oh, how I envy such a father the possession and even the loss of such a child. With what eagerness my heart rushes back to that period when I too triumphed in my son, when I beheld him glowing in the 
all the unadulterated virtues of the happiest nature, flushed with the proud consciousness of superior genius, refined by a taste, intuitively elegant, and warmed by an enthusiasm, constitutionally ardent, his, his character indeed tinctured with the bright coloring of romantic eccentricity, but marked by the indelible traces of innate rectitude, and ennobled by the purest principles of native generosity, the proudest sense of inviolable honor. I beheld him rush eagerly on life, enamored of its seeming good, incredulous of its latent evils, till fatally fascinated by the magic spell of the former, he fell an early victim to the successful lures of the latter. Which I feel like to our modern ears, accustomed to really quick sound bites and like getting to the point really, really fast, the shortest number of characters possible. This is like so foreign to that and yet so beautiful. Here he's taking this long circuitous route to basically say, son, why are you in prison? What was happening in that passage is he's writing to his son who has been imprisoned for gambling debts. And he's saying, I wish you were in prison because you know, you were at Oh, out at war and captured by the enemy. Or I wish you were in prison because, you know, you were unjustly accused and you'd been doing some grand action. And I had such high hopes for you, son. But he says it in such an impossibly eloquent and elegant way. It's a little bit pompous and a little bit verbose, but at the same time, there's something really refreshing and beautiful about it. And I am really enjoying Wild Irish Girl. The story that we're getting set up for here is that um, the second son who had so much promise really got drawn into bad company and drawn into bad habits in town and ended up in jail for gambling debts and got involved in a bad crowd but his father has paid his debts and he's retiring to Ireland um, to their family estate in Ireland. The son has to come and live in Ireland as well. The son in Wild Irish Girl reminds me a little of the character of Mr. Vincent from Belinda. Mr. Vincent is very enthusiastic like he has some sound principles but he just lets him, his enthusiasms carry him away and, and from this guy's letter he sounds like he is very much the same. He's appreciative of his father's generosity, but he doesn't really want to have to go and be banished to Ireland. I love his description of his arrival in Dublin. A foreigner on board the packet compared the view to that which the Bay of Naples affords. I cannot judge of the justice of the comparison, though I am told one very general and commonplace. But if the scenic beauties of the Irish Bay are exceeded by those of the Neapolitan, my fancy falls short in a just conception of its charms. The springing up of a contrary wind kept us for a considerable time, beating about the enchanting coast. The weather suddenly changed, the rain poured in torrents. A storm arose, and the beautiful prospect which had fascinated our gaze vanished in the mists of impenetrable obscurity. Just the enjoyment of words that you find in this is delightful. And and the like sudden twists and turns. I'm very excited to continue on with Wild Irish Girl. It should be very fun leading up to St. Patrick's Day. I almost forgot, I have started a Georgette Hare. I picked up The Unknown Ajax as an audiobook. I've been really enjoying it. The narrator is so British and does a great job with the different British accents. Georgette Hare is just candy. You know, she has none of the eloquent, um, fancy language of like actual Regency authors, but she does have all of the fun little details details of like the house and the servants and the family and the drama and the curricles and all these random uh, Regency era slang and expressions that she just throws in, but it is a really good time. I love all the little details. Like at one point, the daughter of the house, we hear that she is making a reticule with beads in the shape of a Grecian urn. The daughter at one point jokes that they should, that if they get like kicked out of the ancestral estate, they could just set up a shop, a milliner's shop in Bath and charge outrageous, outrageous prices. There's another little detail about how the two brothers who don't really get along, their manservants are even more at odds. One of them has this like secret recipe for a boot, uh, you know, boot polish. And like his boots are like shinier than anybody's. They're like mirrors. And the other manservant is so jealous and wants to know how he can find that, <laughs> that recipe. Georgette Hare is just a lark. It, it's like a Regency Downton Abbey book version. Have they ever adapted a Georgette Hare into a film? I don't, I don't think they have. I should look this up. When we were discussing Belinda, I was thinking why on earth have they not done Belinda as a movie? It would be spectacular. Like, I don't know why they came up with Bridgerton. They should have just adapted Belinda. Although I have no faith in Hollywood these days, so maybe it's best that they keep their hands off of beautiful old books. One other interesting fact that I learned during our Belinda book club was that there is an audiobook version narrated by Charlotte Lucas, like one of the actresses who plays Charlotte Lucas in the Pride and Prejudice adaptations. So now I kind of wish I had listened to the audiobook. Listen to Charlotte Lucas read 
Big Belinda? That sounds fabulous. So the one Feb Regency challenge, which I have not mentioned yet, is Tristan's challenge, which was to engage in a Regency pastime or activity, which this year, I'm a little bit cheating, not really cheating. I feel like this does fit. Um, but lately I've been getting into dancing and the lessons that I've been able to find like within a reasonable drive of me have mostly been swing dancing. I wish I could find like legit Regency era line dancing cause that would be fun. But this one dance that I went to recently, it did involve like the men in one line, the women in another and like some changing back and forth. And it was such a delight that it made me realize who let traditional dancing go out of fashion? It just seems so tragic that these days when you go to like a dance, it's usually just a bunch of pop music and a bunch of people just kind of shimmying on the floor. And you know, that, that can be fun too, but traditional dancing is so fun that I don't know how we let it go out of fashion. I'll have to look harder. Maybe I'll be able to find some, some Regency dancing, but I feel like just any traditional dancing, even the swing, should count towards this challenge. Because dancing, of course, was a huge social activity during the Regency. One of those like Jane Austen era documentaries that I watched, they had like a whole section where they were planning a ball and they, they were, you know, following the, the dance steps of the, the dancers learning to do this Regency era dance. They look so fabulous and intricate. And it's amazing when you read Jane Austen, you know, actually these other authors don't necessarily have these beautiful conversations that happen on a dance floor. That's kind of unique to Jane Austen. She uses dance quite a lot. The other Regency era authors I've been reading don't necessarily use it as much. But just the fact that these characters are able to have these conversations while they are dancing, these fairly intricate patterns is, is mind boggling. I'm not there yet. When I'm swing dancing, I can't talk to anyone. I'm just trying not to stare at my feet and I'm mentally saying step, step, rock step, 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 rock step. Like I'm just trying to keep the beat. You know, I love to read, I love to write, I love words. I love being able to, you know, pinpoint a scene or a feeling or a description in, you know, on a piece of paper and like you can understand it and you've got it right there laid out in front of you. But dancing, you're communicating through movement. You're not communicating through words at all. And of course in dancing, traditionally, the man is the lead and the woman is the follow. And I have found that being a follow is actually kind of challenging because you don't know what move is coming next. Like the, the lead, the guy chooses what, what move, what spin he's gonna put you into next. So you don't know what's coming. And then on top of that, because I'm pretty new to swing dancing, I haven't done it very much. I don't even understand like the, the twists and the turns and like I don't even know exactly what it is. And yet it, when you have a good partner, they are able to put you through the turns. And it's kind of miraculous to me that like it actually works. And like I managed to do the turn when I didn't know what was coming and I didn't understand. But I was thinking, I feel like this lesson carries over to other parts of life, especially to faith in God, because we're meant to follow God's will for our life. We're not meant to, you know, push our own will on our lives because it never goes well. It's, it goes best when we follow God's will for our lives. And I sometimes wish like God would just write it out, you know, on a piece of paper, tell me what you want me to do and where you want me to go. And like, I'll be there. Just tell me though, rationally what it is. But that's not how God works. God works more like the lead in dancing where he just sort of gently pushes you and you just kind of have to be ready to follow wherever he goes. But it is difficult because you don't know what's coming and you don't even understand what happens as it happens. But when you can be a good follower of God, it does all go well and it is a beautiful dance. And so I feel like I'm learning some good lessons. And obviously it's not something that our culture values very much these days. I feel like these days it's like everyone wants to be the leader, but actually there's something to be said in being the follower. There is power and skill involved in you know, being at rest and being able to follow where the leader goes. And especially if it, you're talking about God's will for your life, that's really incredibly important for both men and women to learn to be good followers and to follow God's grace gracefully. <laughs> so let's see, what am I gonna be reading in the month of March? Gonna be continuing Wild Irish Girl. Uh, FYI, our next book club is gonna be The Little White Horse by Elizabeth Googe. Very excited for that one. We're gonna be discussing it Saturday, March 30th at noon Eastern 
Eastern time. If you're not on the book club email list yet, you can just send me an email. I'm at bookishprincess.com and I will send you um, the link. Also, now that I've got my Febregency reads out of the way, I'm gonna be buckling down to The Long Loneliness by Dorothy Day. This is a Lenten read along I'm doing with some other booktubers and we're gonna be having a live show on Palm Sunday, um, which is the 24th, I think, to discuss that. So that should be lovely. I haven't even really started on it yet, but I do still have a couple weeks to go. I hope you all had a wonderful reading month. As always, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments below. I'll talk to you all again soon and until then, stay bookish. Bye friends.